before I even get into this, I will, like I say, at every one of my presentations, and if you've been there, you will know this, that although I am on the State Board of Education, I do not speak for the State Board. But I do speak for No Common Core Maine, and today we'll be talking about uh, the package deal. And Peg and uh, Mercedes set the stage quite nicely. And I, I say, look under the hood and see what's driving this thing. So let's look at some philosophies that are out there, and we'll look at foundational philosophies. In our dreams, people yield themselves with perfect docility to our molding hands. The present education conventions of intellectual, intellectual and character education fade from their minds and unhampered by tradition, we work our own goodwill upon a grateful and responsive folk. We shall not try to make these people or any of their children into men of learning, or philosophers, or men of science. We have not to raise up from them authors, educators, poets, or men of letters, great artists, painters, musicians, nor lawyers, doctors, statesmen, politicians, creatures of whom we have ample supply. Oh. The, the task is simple. We will organize children and teach them in a perfect way the things their fathers and mothers are doing in an imperfect way. And because of the sake of time, I'm not going to have audience participation right now, but usually I, I take a, ask people to take a guess as to when and where this uh, was uh, drafted. And that goes back to 1913, and it was the bill, uh, was um, the John D. Rockefeller mission statement for their um, John D. Rockefeller, uh, Rockefeller uh, Foundation. But our overarching intent here, what we've heard about today, is the Common Core State Standards, or K-12 Content Standards for English Language Arts and Math, and that the package being created, as we've already heard, are the standards, and the standards drive the curriculum. The goal is towards a nationalized curriculum, which we heard about earlier today. And then, included in this is also the, is the high stakes testing, where the monitoring system comes into play in the data collection that Peg just so beautifully explained. This is going to influence the uh, students' scores as well as impact teachers. And all of this is being collected and controlled ultimately to the federal level by the uh, testing in high tech, the high tech industries. So since we're Maine, no Common Core Maine, uh, a lot, we have New Hampshire and Massachusetts represented today. And some of this is actually going to apply to them. Massachusetts belongs to Park, and that's about the only difference here. And also Massachusetts won money where the other two states didn't. But Maine agreed to adopt the Common Core State Standards Initiative prior to the actual standards being released for money with Race to the Top, which was the grant. And we received no money, except we did receive money for the state longitudinal data system, which Peg was alluding to. We also agree to fully implement the standards of math and English language arts that are now part of our main learning results. We also agreed uh, to receive a waiver under No Child Left Behind, and Aaron spoke on that. And we agreed to implement high stakes testing, and we're part of the Smarter Balanced Assessment Consortia. Student data sharing will be coming in at the state level, and it will eventually get to the federal level. Now, Peg was just talking about reading the contracts, and you can read the document that is the agreement with U the U.S. Department of Education and the Smarter Balanced Assessment Consortium and Washington State, our acting fiscal agent. Now, anyone part of the Smarter Balanced Consortium is part of Washington State. They, Washington represents us. And in this agreement, we, as the states, part of Smarter Balanced, agreed to turn over our data to the Smarter Balanced Assessment Consortium. Well, Smarter Balanced signed the agreement that they will turn over all the information and all the data they collect to the federal DOE. So this ties teachers and school evaluations, all based on the student uh, testing and data collection. So it's mentioned, been mentioned before today, it's the largest uncontrolled experiment in the history of public education. So this is just a, uh, a web, <laughs> just to show you the number, there, there's, you know, you always say follow the money. Well, here's an example of, you can follow the money, and you can see some of the uh, players here, 
and you have the Gates Foundation, Walton, Broad, Pearson. We're going to see a little bit of Pearson, a slice of what they do. And then way over here on the right, you see NCEE, and uh, someone mentioned them earlier, the National Council for uh, Economics and Education, or Education, I get those two mixed up. Anyway, uh, you have um, Mark Tucker, who is the uh, head of that, and his thoughts on education are this. We plan to remold the entire American system into a seamless web that literally extends from cradle to grave and is the same system for everyone, coordinated by a system of labor market boards at the local, state, and federal levels, where curriculum and job matching will be handled by counselors accessing the integrated computer-based program. Sounds like a little bit of what we've been hearing today. Furthermore, he added, his plan would change the mission of schools from teaching children academic basics and knowledge to training them to serve the global economy in jobs selected by workforce boards. He wrote this letter, it was an 18-page letter that he wrote to Hillary Clinton. You can Google it and read all 18 pages. And um, this uh, was written the day after Bill was elected. And uh, it was so concerning to a congressman that was read into the congressional record. But essentially, throughout their documents, you will read uh, our children are basically human capital to be used as a cog in the global labor market. Now, I, I'm very visual and I needed to have a chart to see what is exactly happening here. And you start with the standards that are leading towards a one-size-fits-all nationalized curriculum. We don't have that yet, but that's where it's headed. Basically, the curriculum is being driven by the standards towards the high-stakes tests. For us, it's Smarter Balance. For Massachusetts, it's Park. New Hampshire is part of Smarter Balance as well. But that's where the data collection comes into play. And then it splits off into two directions. One is where the teachers are evaluated and school reviews, and then that's where if they don't do well, the state federal uh, action can take place. I'm not going to talk about that. That's a whole presentation in itself. Um, I'm going to talk about the data collection going into the pre-selected career college pathways, which then funnel into the global labor, labor market. And I have a little personal experience with this. So I want to show you, though, an actual advertisement of poor little Anthony has his head uh, chopped off here. Way back the screen up. Okay. Uh, and you can, if you look at it, you'll see this little guy. That, no, you got to bring it closer. You got to bring it. Yeah, there we go. Um, if you look at what he excels at, language arts and history. What does he struggle at? Science. Look at his scores. Science is pretty low. Math is pretty low. But look at his projected career. <laughs> Mechanical engineering. Well, um, there's a major disconnect here and <laughs> highly problematic. Because if you know of an engineer, I'm married to one, and you know of people who are really good at the, in the histories and, and uh, in the humanities, essentially language arts, that, those are two different types of brains. They work differently. Not that one can't do the other, but they don't excel necessarily in the same areas. So here's an example of what they're doing with a student and tracking him into a career path with all the recommended schools and all that wonderful stuff. So I have personal experience with being tracked. I grew up overseas in the German school system. And at fourth grade, I was tracked to the trade school. It's either the trade school or university. And they determined at fourth grade that I did not have the intellectual gray matter capacity to handle university level work. Um, we moved here. I had to learn to read and write English, so in sixth grade, I'm learning to read and write English. I graduated early from high school, got a double science degree. Uh, I think they may have missed the mark. <laughs> <laughs> so here's governing philosophies. The state effort to improve student achievement should focus on workforce policies and practices and on workforce funding decisions that improve the quality of the educational workforce. To do this, governors should consider a comprehensive human capital approach that strategically invests in teachers and principals 
And that, in turn, can improve student improvement or outcomes. Essentially, we're talking about the elites predetermining the jobs that will be filled and who to fill them with. This is job prescription. This is the National Governors Association, their Center for Best Practices in 2009. But here's a former governing philosophy. So folks, this has been around for a long time, and this is what, this is, I'm trying to set the stage, that this has been, they've been working on this for a long time. We want one class of persons to have a liberal education, and we want another class of persons, a very much larger class, of necessity, in every society to forego the privileges of a liberal education and fit themselves to perform specific difficult manual tasks. That was Woodrow Wilson. Mm. And now we have a current governing philosophy where Arnie Duncan has said, and yes, Google this, he did say this, we should be able to look every second grader in the eye and say, you're on track, you're going to be able to go to a good college or you are not. <laughs> but here are some things that students, you can't test. And I would like to present to you the idea that this is what makes the human being. It's not quantifying every single movement, blink of an eye, muscle twitch, and, and fitting it into a specific cog. But think about persistence. I know there's, there's grit, tenacity, and perseverance paper that uh, is going to try and they talk about how they're going to capture that. You can Google that too. That's uh, U.S. Department of Education wrote a white paper that's, um, that will get you on divided attention. How they're going to gather that uh, information and try and quantify it. But let's just think about some things that make the human being, the, the quality of a person. Curiosity, enthusiasm, courage, leadership, creativity, civic mindedness, resourcefulness, self-discipline, a sense of wonder. I wonder if this is destroying that. Um, <laughs> big picture thinking, compassion, reliability, motivation, humor, Empathy, sense of beauty, humility, resilience. <coughs> and let's look at this. This is on the law books in the state of Maine. Teaching virtue and morality. Instructors of youth in public or private institutions shall use their best endeavors to impress on the minds of the children and youth committed to their care and instruction the principles of morality and justice and a sacred regard of truth, for truth, sorry. Love of country, humanity, and, a, I love this, a universal benevolence. The great principle of humanity is illustrated by kindness to birds and animals, and regard for all factors which contribute to the well-being of man. Industry and frugality, <coughs> chastity, moderation, and temperance, and all other virtues which ornament human society and to lead those under their care as their ages and capacities admit into a practical understanding of the tendency of such virtues to pr preserve and perfect a republican constitution, secure the beliefs, the, the blessings of liberty, and to promote their future happiness. That's not Which leads me to this next point. Let's just think about this for a second. When this country was established, why was it established? People came here for a reason. What was that reason? Religious Freedom. Economic opportunity. Independence. Right? From what? What did they want freedom or independence from? King. Persecution, tyranny, okay. telling them essentially what to do, where to do it, how to do it, and why to do it. Okay? And then we crafted a document that stated that we have rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Think about what I just read in the rule, main rule in education law. The pursuit of happiness is oftentimes just glossed over. But what does that really mean? It really means it's freedom that allows us to pursue happiness 
And that freedom is to choose to pursue the desires of your heart. You can start on one track and go to a whole other track. I started out doing whale research. <laughs> yes, I'm a marine biologist. And now I'm a goat herder. <laughs> That's the freedom to choose. I do a few other things in between. But the freedom to fail. We have the freedom to fail. Somebody mentioned that earlier. The failure is almost final now. The freedom to fail means you fail, get up, try again, fail, get up, try again. There's a freedom in doing that. You're not penalized for failure. Failure is one of the most profound, teachable moments. And I applaud teachers who actually will fail a student who needs to fail. Because sometimes that's what gets their undivided attention. It's like, oh, wow, that, it matters? Yeah. Uh, so we also have the freedom to use our free will to direct the course of our life. I think Peg brought up a really good point. I mean, is that happening? Is that, is that the direction we're going in, folks? And I always say this, I work with many, many students. I hire 60 some odd teenagers every year. I run a ski school and I have that many individuals that work for me. And I say to them, Sh always shoot for the stars because you might hit the moon. And we have the freedom to dream and to dream big and to go for it. That's freedom. But my question is, is that still the pattern that we're pursuing? And I am concerned that we're heading in the wrong direction. We need to think about enterprise and innovation philosophy, where as long as a student, as students are told that the end of education is a job or a career, they will forever be servants of some master. We're not programming machines. We're teaching children. We're not producing functionaries, factory-like. We are to be forming the minds and hearts of men and women to be human beings honoring what is good and right and cherish what is beautiful. Mm. I'd say this professor understands education and understands that the students that he has and the students that we have are malleable changeable and should not be quantified in a rigid formula for a purpose outside of their own direction. So I leave you with this thought. What do you desire for your children, your grandchildren, your nieces, nephews, little people that you know? What is your desire for their lives? And I thank you for your attention.